Okay, so Linus, there's desktop computers and then there's like server computers, but how different are they exactly? Well, any computer actually has the same basic components, processor, working memory, storage, etc. And you may be surprised to hear that fundamentally they're not that different with some of those components even coming off the same assembly line. But that doesn't mean that you can just grab off the shelf desktop components and like fashion yourself a server. I mean, sure, this Core i7 runs at 3.8 gigahertz and this Xeon runs at 3.8 gigahertz, but it costs way more. Well, hold on in just a second, hold off on the Core i7. Sometimes there's more to it than gigahertz and gigabytes and all those gigas. So let's get this list of differences kicked off. Number one, we just discovered server gear is much more expensive for specifications that often appear similar or even worse at times. But why? You get intercompatibility with other other server grade hardware, things like ECC and registered RAM support, a bullet point that's hidden halfway down the product page for that CPU from before. Now, while using memory that is slightly more resistant to errors might not seem like a big deal to a typical desktop user, it's absolutely critical for a server. In a desktop environment, one little tiny RAM error caused by like Cosmic rays might cost little Sally the cute picture she made in MS Paint, but in a server, it could result in the loss of a patient's medical records or who knows what else. Not to mention, speaking of intercompatibility, that server memory is available in much higher capacities, so you gotta have support for that. We find the next difference in the little details, the characteristics of a product that don't always find their way onto a spec sheet. For example, server and workstation grade hardware uses higher quality components and is subjected to much more rigorous quality testing and validation. They not only are made to handle heavier duty cycles, but also live longer overall while doing it. Now onto features. Silent operation, a bunch of USB 3 ports, and like overclocking settings out the wazoo are not the kinds of things that server clients will want to spend money on. Which doesn't mean that they're cheapskates. They'll pay big money for stuff like fancy networking capabilities, remote management interfaces, and hardware redundancy so that the machine won't experience any downtime even in the event of a hardware failure on something like a power supply. And it's great that they buy this stuff because it drives the costs down for us desktop folks in the future. So my next point, actually ties at least partially into most of the others. Server hardware is optimized for different workloads. For example, on the desktop, our applications aren't heavily multi-threaded, so higher frequency processors with fewer cores work really well. But a server might run an operating system and software that takes much better advantage of multiple processing cores. So we might get much better results with a lower clocked server CPU that has more processing cores, or even with multiple CPUs to further spread up the workload. And then finally, there are the optimization made for the environment in which a server will operate. For example, a consumer and enterprise grade hard drive might share much of the same technology, it's a bit of a recurring theme here, but a server hard drive is much more resistant to wear and tear from vibration, something that doesn't matter for a drive sitting in a desktop by itself, but that is critical for a drive that's surrounded on all sides by other drives spinning and clicking away doing their own work. And there are so many little things like this. A server won't compromise compromise on power consumption or increase size unnecessarily to squeeze a little bit more performance out of the hardware like a gaming rig would. It's all about how much computing power can fit in as small a space as possible while consuming as little power as possible. The general consumer has different priorities and a big tower that consumes a couple more watts doesn't really matter when you got one family PC in the house or even two or three or four. But if you were buying 5,000 of them, it would be a different story, which is exactly how I'm going to segue, awkwardly reaching for it here, into our sponsor message about razors. If once per year I had to go buy one razor, the time and money that I wasted driving to the store and like slaying the guardian of indifference who holds the key of unnecessary existence that unlocks the secret shelf of razor door just to get a close comfortable shave on my face, None of that would be an issue. The problem is that you have to do it all the time. And that's where Dollar Shave Club comes in. For a few bucks a month, Dollar Shave Club delivers razors straight to your door every month without any hassle or BS. The blades are 
Uh, well, they're that. The service is prompt and the quality is as good as or better than the brand name ones. Join the club now at dollarshaveclub.com slash Linus and check out their shaving supplies as well as their One Wipe Charlies, which are peppermint scented butt wipes for men. They're really great. I've been getting all kinds of compliments on the smell of my butt since I started using them. Thanks for checking out this episode of Fast as Possible. Like this video if you liked it. Dislike it if you disliked it. Leave a comment if you have suggestions for future episodes of Fast as Possible or if you just have something to say about you know this video or the smell of my butter whatever else we're totally open to your feedback actually maybe we should avoid that last topic you know I don't want this video to get flagged for inappropriate content it's like wow that, that's the most amazing butt ever and I, I think we're done here don't forget to subscribe to Tech Cookie for more videos like this from me and the rest of my team